Big round of applause while she makes her way. Come on, people. Bring the noise. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte Mayer, founder and managing director of The Fitting Room. Um, so, some of you probably know some of our work. We kind of fell into being a hospitality agency, um, and we're now falling out of being one. Uh, so, our revenue is about 60% um, from this industry, and then we work across lifestyle, entertainment, and as I say to everybody, we're very focused on just creating cool shit. Um, we work on three principles of we create hype, demand, and legacy for businesses and brands. So, our clients vary from Popeyes to Idris Elba. Uh, it's a real broad broadsheet actually and it's helped us really focus on making the agency stand out because our approach is completely different when we are going into hospitality pitches. So we have a methodology and this kind of came from a book called We're All the Same Age Now that's written by a guy called Chris Allison that looks at the change in culture and people to do with how we buy. So five years ago when I was going into hospitality pitches Everyone was kind of asking for the same shit, and I was like, oh, this is actually killing my soul a little bit. People don't consume like this, they don't behave like this. The world changed. And we wanted to be at the forefront of that with some of the work that we do. So we create our own methodology that looked at the value graphics and belief systems and behaviors of humans that are probably the things that you don't see in, say, a stereotypical demographic. So we have a grid of nine that goes into all of our decks, and think about it as like an Instagram window and it looks at things that connect people rather than separate people. So this principle that we're all the same age now was actually driven by when Beyonce launched one of her Ivy Park Rangers. She gave a load of tracksuits to a load of creators in LA and told them to go out and shoot it. And a guy called Eric Hart shot his grandparents wearing the full Ivy Park wear. And it was the same week that Hayley Baldwin, and sorry, Hayley Bieber, and uh, Kendall Jenner wore them as well. And we kind of put the two photos next to each other. We kind of had these legacy black grandparents in LA but then you had kind of the hottest supermodels in the world wearing exactly the same thing. And this drove us to really get fo focused on what cool means, what cool means in different communities and how you drive the cool. So for us, we start out with kind of who we're talking to, these nine principles of these values that connect these people. And then we start to look at subcultures and subcommunities. I think in the UK, because we're always slightly behind America, we always talk about being 10 years behind America. We don't look at subcultures in the same way because we don't have so many people in this country. But understanding subcultures that essentially go on to shape mainstream pop culture is really important. And I think we're seeing that with a lot of big brands. If you look at how Wingstop became Wingstop, they became Wingstop because of Rick Ross. So when they came to the UK, they didn't really have to do a huge amount because of his weight in hip hop carried it straight to the youth market here. And I think if you look at brands like um, Slutty Vegan that's just opened in New York and moved out of Atlanta, they have half a million Instagram followers and they only had six sites. And that is because they aligned themselves to being a lifestyle brand rather than being very, very focused on food and drink. And I think when we entered the marketplace, that's where we were like, yeah, all right, you've got nice food and it's fresh, but does anybody really give a shit about that now? So we wanted to get our clients to think forward um, not alienating that core, but looking at a different kind of conversation that you could have. You then kind of got how that sort of goes into hype, demand, and legacy, and cultural relevancy. And when I was presenting these pillars to my team, I said, you know, from a legacy perspective, think about the morning that Tiffany and Co. woke up and thought, shit, the dog chains, they're not relevant anymore. How do we get relevant? Oh, we're going to get Jay-Z and Beyonce to be the new face of our campaign. It's that journey. So I said this statement when we first went into lockdown and a few CEOs WhatsApp me saying, Charlotte, what the fuck? And I was like, but it's true. Um, because actually we should have been doing these things previously. And in lockdown, my younger brother that had worked at TFR with me for four years, he had always wanted a food business. And in the second week of lockdown, I gave him an idea that I had given to one of the biggest pub groups in the country four years ago, to which they had declined. And he now, two and a half years in, is running a business doing that fully uh, in the food service industry, catering for Piers Morgan, Amanda Holden, Rag and Bone Man. And it, it was meant to kind of put the spirit of, okay, the chips are down, but you can do cool shit without requiring huge budgets. And we did some slightly controversial things in lockdown, but we also got our clients big headlines. 
So what does fuck the fear mean? So me coming into this industry as a black woman with braids was definitely a different experience and somebody with a lot of opinion. Um, if you know me, you'll know that. It, was, it was, became my morning mantra of actually how I started to get through the days. Then it became a company mantra and it became a conversation with the team about have you fucked up enough this week? Did you push your clients to think differently about what they were doing? So that could be anything from going to do a photo shoot to looking at what influencer strategy, like it was kind of this thing that when we started to hire, we started to really think about, is this person ballsy enough to have those conversations? Or are they gonna, as soon as the client says, actually, we've always done it like this, they're just gonna go with it. So we wanted to really raise this fuck the fear mentality. And as I say, a few years ago, hospitality was kind of our mainstream um, in terms of revenue. So we really nailed down on this and we did some really slightly wild campaigns and another big pub group, I think for the first year that we won the contract, in every single status meeting, they reminded me that we were the wild card. We weren't actually the wild card. We were just truly in tune with what customers and guests actually wanted as opposed to the old school. We want someone with a mid to high disposable income that's 25 to 32 in the home counties, comes into the London that we can We wanted them to think differently about that. So we actually track failure in TFR and at the team meeting every Monday for ops, we talk about how much someone fucked up the week before and how much they're planning to fuck up that same week, which seems really strange, but it actually made people start to have different conversations around, is this a bit too far? And I'm one of those people that's like, it's never too far. And we can kind of always water it down, but we need to start at that point. It could be so much more interesting. And I think if you look at what the brands are doing in America, they come at it from very much, this is a lifestyle. Yes, we are hospitality. Yes, we do serve food and drink, but you can do it in a much more vibey way. So I, <laughs> I said at a, a talk that I did last week, is it actually that the juniors within hospitality aren't pushing the boundaries or is it that hospitality has predominantly been led by the same groups of people for a number of years that we kind of have these behaviours that no one wants to push that boundaries and therefore we don't create an environment for people to be comfortable with fucking up because you know, it's very much a, everything was due yesterday on a shoestring budget. So actually, what have we got to do at the top to get more people to come into this industry and want to come into this industry? And again, I say to clients, this isn't just having a fucking TikTok. That is not, that is not winning in life. Um, there's a lot more that can be done in that. And I think as well, the changes that again are coming across the pond, you know, Tiny Temper has launched his raps range. We are seeing the role of celebrity and influence play a very different part. If you look at brands like Reef that are doing incredible things, we represent the YouTubers side men and we look after their brand sides which is absolutely insane because their reach is bigger than the BBC they have a vodka brand that sold out like 10,000 bottles in eight minutes and they didn't do anything traditional you wouldn't have read about that in the press you wouldn't have seen that anywhere that was about true authentic audiences and them no they do some of the most random shit ever it's 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 insane but that stuff sells now and it gets people more interested than here's a new piece of POS and here's my perfect Instagram feed. That isn't kind of where we are anymore. So this is something that one of my mentors said to me years ago, if you do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And I wrote about this on LinkedIn today, you know, we're, we're about to enter really challenging choppy waters. And from when I think back to when we pitched five years ago for shit and people would say, no, Charlotte, that's just a bit too much. To the briefs and inquiries that are now coming in, asking us to be too much because they understand that to compete properly and to still scale with the economic challenges that we've got, they have to do things differently. So I always say this, <laughs> fuck the fit isn't the amount of meetings that I sit in. Can we get a viral TikTok? No, that's not how it works. Um, suddenly people, you know, influencers, again, looking at people's influencer strategy, the word influencer has completely lost the weight that it had five years ago, much like the term bloggers. And we started to talk to clients about the role of creators because they have a much bigger impact and they essentially do your jobs for you. Suddenly that very expensive photo shoot that you would normally do twice a year doesn't need to happen because they create such a high level of UGC content that feels more authentic, it can come in a completely different shape to, again, how we've always done it. And again, I sat in another meeting the other day and someone said to me, how do we get 100,000 listens on our Spotify playlist? And I was like, send help. I cannot have this conversation. That's not how it works. But again, these are kind of three key themes um, from recent me meetings. And again, anyone that's worked with me knows that if it's not a vibe, I'll be like, no, this isn't for us. Come back in a year once you've been pushed to really wanting to commit to do something totally fucking different. 
So this was actually something that somebody at Wagamama's said to me a few years ago when we were producing a podcast for them. And um, they were talking about me making them get comfortable with the uncomfortable because I, again, being a black woman in hospitality has its strengths and weaknesses, but one of the strengths that it has is that I can say a lot of shit that other people could not get away with. And I really like doing that because people's response is normally more open um, than if some of my team said it. And I think this is the epitome of fuck the fear, it is getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and how you embody that in your business from leadership to marketing. I think, again, you know, a lot of people think the perception of marketing hospitality is, oh, you push out a press release, you get a social media post up, that's what you do. But again, with the changing times, it's going to require something completely different. When we launched Popeyes into the UK last year, we took out a graffiti wall in Shoreditch that was a scannable, kind of get in a virtual queue to try the first chicken sandwich for when they opened at Stratford. We did a whole big hype campaign. We had two TikTokers called Jay Montel recreate Jay-Z's public service announcement to talk about Popeyes coming to the UK. And we basically rewrote Jay-Z's rap. And then we intertwined that with um, the Daily Duppy. I don't think, I don't know if anyone in this room knows GRM, but GRM, which is a grime website on a Sunday, they have a, a freestyle rapper come on and do something, but across the screen is animation. So we put the two things together. So all of Popeye's products and everything came across the screen, as well as the guys re-rapping Jay-Z's verses. And we got 1.5 million views in about a day and a half. So some of our campaigns that embody all of this is that I think people will probably know some of these, is the House of Ice Cream that we did for Fuller's. Um, this was a really interesting one because trying to make Fuller's brand colours of kind of gold, red and navy sexy was nigh on impossible. And before we went into production that week, I messaged one of the marketing team and said, I'm ripping up your brand guidelines. We're going full Kylie Jenner. If I fuck it up, don't pay me my fee. And that was kind of what we went with. So the dripping ice cream, I don't know if you know, the only thing that connects all Fuller's pubs is that their ice cream is buffalo milk from Laverstoke Park Farm. So that was the only thing that we could do that would mean that if you went into any site, you'd be able to get the same dish. So at the time, Kylie Jenner was on track to becoming the first self-made billionaire and her drip lip kits were everywhere. So we wanted to recreate the drip lip kits as the logo for it. And honestly, I think this is the first time they've ever changed their brand. So we went with blue and pink and we then created a dish that was ice cream, hot sauce, fried chicken and chips. And that was our hero dish. And that was the one that got us 17 million views on Lad Bible within 24 hours. Again, it wasn't what anyone was expecting from Fuller's, but it was the headline that got us Secret London, Time Out, all of those spots. And where we did, we, we basically took a dead spot in one of our pubs in Farringdon and completely rewrapped the space. And at the time it wasn't being used. So we were putting money into the bottom line, but it was all focused on pop culture. Another one was the Prosecco ATM for Vagabond. Again, this was Vagabond 2020, just before lockdown, going into their new site in Monument. And we had just done a wine wall to celebrate 100 years of prohibition at King's Cross Station to celebrate that Canary Wharf opening. And we created a Prosecco ATM that went viral and ended up on the Jimmy Fallon show in the US between the State of the Union and the Super Bowl, which was a bit fucking mad. And it was, it was everywhere. And I sit in so many meetings where people say, Charlotte, can we have a Prosecco ATM? And I'm like, fam, no, that has been, we don't do that again. But again, this was based on hip hop star Miss Banks doing a pop-up bank with Pretty Little Thing as a campaign. And we looked at that and we're like, how can we create a version of that? And that's how we ended up at this campaign. And that's why I say like, the fuck the fear, what the end result is, doesn't have to be totally wild, but the inspiration as to where it comes from should be beyond hospitality. Again, I say to a lot of our clients when they say these are our competitors, no one gives a shit. What is fashion saying? What is music saying? What is lifestyle saying? How are these things shaping and influencing the customers that you want to get into your restaurant or bar? Sausage roll off, another one for Fuller's. How do you make our annual roll off interesting to people? Well, you get Kate Ovens that is this tiny, fabulous woman that does um, eating competitions to come in and eat a three foot long sausage roll and have to vomit a few times in between. And then you see that story out to the national newspapers. And that's what we did. And again, that was on Capital Heart, that was on BBC News, it went everywhere. And the, the key thing about these ones with the fuck the fear is, I always say to people, keep 80% of your core and be so, so clear on them, but take 20% and just say, fuck it, what's the worst that can happen here when trying to attract a new customer? So how do you create an environment for failure? So I talk about failing quite a lot and I have failed quite a lot 
but with the team meeting on a Monday, we talk about everything that we know that other agencies won't be having conversations about. And I think where we've got quite um, an inclusive team, we have, again, one of my learnings when I first entered hospitality was that it was quite a privileged industry and a lot of people were sort of from the same circles. And we tried to actually build the absolute opposite of that in our people so that we have different perspectives. And we have very premium stuff. You know, we, we do big shit for Idris and then we do cool shit for Popeyes. It's, it, it's about being conversational and it's about leaders asking different questions at those team meetings. So instead of being transactional and what did you see so-and-so launch this pizza offer, what can we do? It's did you see Anne Hathaway was sat next to... Anna Wintour at Fashion Week last week and the brown jacket made its comeback and what's this going to do for pop culture and how can we turn this into a meme or a TikTok or something like that? It's about taking pop culture and having different conversations with it. So this is our circle of hype. So this is the business of hype. So this is from um, Abraham Maslow and his need state as to how you get people queuing up like a maniac like me in New York to buy new Yeezys. Like what happens in my brain and what happens in my consumption to make me go on and want to do that? And people think, oh, it's just hype, but it's not. It's, it's neuro, right? It's so deeply entrenched in us as to how we buy. And Kim Kardashian, love her or hate her, I love her, uh, is the absolute queen of it. And even now, I, I put out a TikTok last week saying, did Kanye West deliberately go into deals with Adidas and Gap just to leverage their audience for a year or two, make his billions, and then essentially, I mean, I forgot to sell my shares in Gap before he made his announcement that he was outing, but deliberately bring those businesses down to a, gra down to a standstill. Because again, he is... You know, you think of him as Kanye, but he's also the face of McDonald's. He's done some big stuff in the hospitality industry as well, like he did the Super Bowl ad this year. And thinking about these things differently as to the need state of how you get somebody wanting something is why we went with hype, demand, and legacy. Modern creators, just put in a few here. Obviously, Stephen Bartlett, you know, grew social chain to what it is and is now a creator and influencer in his own right. For those of you that don't know, Emma Grady is the woman behind all of the Kardashian brands. She is a partner within all of those brands. I'm not actually a Kanye stan anymore, I have to say, because he's been in a lot of fuckery recently. But he's on there because he is a, he is a decent creator. Shonda Rhimes, again, she gave us Bridgerton. She gave us How to Get Away with Murder. She gave us Grey's Anatomy. But she came at every single TV show looking at how do you make two worlds collide culturally from an experience, be that elitism, racism, sexism, whatever. She puts them all into these shows and no one even thinks, oh, this show was produced by a black woman because it isn't the sort of black conversation that the media gives us. She's looking at the world through a completely different cultural lens. And Ryan Reynolds, not only do I just love him, he's also just the king of content. He just creates really cool shit. And again, at a time when celebrities are on Instagram and TikTok, he's building a following for himself on LinkedIn, saying super funny shit and being a little bit controversial because he also knows that's where the brand deals are. So some modern brands as well, Fear of God, obviously they were, Kanye was their creative director for a number of years. Gymshark has completely shaken up how we perceive athleisure wear, what we think about sportswear, and I, I just think they're winning, and their new store that's obviously opening in Regent Streets in a couple of weeks is going to be a completely different experience to what you would get if you went to, say, a Nike town. And how they've leveraged the CEO, founder, Ben Francis, to be a real voice is quite something, the sort of rise that we're seeing in LinkedIn influencers, side men, I mean, that, that reach, as I said, is bigger than the BBC. It's insane. And then two really interesting ones that are very american focus is Telfar and Slutty Vegan. Slutty Vegan, if you don't know them, you should look them up because their content and the conversations and the brand collaborations that they do with, like, having their own nail polish, having their own bag, you're not expecting that from a vegan restaurant that's come out of Atlanta, but they really do put themselves at the forefront of culture and lifestyle, and I would love us to be able to do more of that in the UK, but I don't know if the energy is quite there yet as much as we try and push our clients into it. And then Telfer, you know, they basically, the, the guy that founded it, took all of his worst experiences and made it into a brand around inclusion. And they are much like Kanye, the kings of doing bag drops, limited edition, crazy, crazy demand. In 2021, they were number three on the, the hardest fashion piece to be able to buy. Um, Beyonce blew them up because she wore one of their yellow bags and it, it, it all went nuts. But they've launched a TV show. They've had partnerships with Eastpac and are completely different things to what you'd be expecting that type of brand to actually do. So this was our theme for this year that, as I said, 
Um, yesterday, I thought there was only 30 people coming today, not 130. Uh, but our theme at TFR this year was Big Dick Energy. And we talk about this, again, quite frequently and inappropriately uh, within the business as to what that means and how we're channeling that with our clients. And now, actually, it's become a bit of a conversation because when we say to our clients, we're going to go for this, and they're like, yeah, TFR is going to bring that Big Dick Energy. And it literally means, fuck the fear, let's go and do something really interesting and have a conversation that nobody's expecting us to. And I think all of that leads on to Stormzy is a great example of this. Obviously, at a time when artists are looking to get trending on TikTok and are kind of jumping on the bandwagon of all the hype, Stormzy releases a 10-minute visual dedicated to his stylist, Melissa's wardrobe. And if you know Mel, you'll know her hashtag is Mel Made Me Do It, which is essentially when you go and buy shit that you don't need because it's fabulous. And she has a huge following based on that. Stormzy then released an incredible visual that was dedicated to black British heritage and had some of the biggest people that have influenced what started off as black culture, but is essentially mainstream culture in the UK. And again, whilst it's not this kind of loud fuck the fear, it is a version of fuck the fear because at a time when all of the other artists that he's competing against for chart are doing these TikToks and these very basic things, he was like, now nah, I'm going to do 10 minutes and I'm going to spend 18 months working on this project and I'm going to bring in some of the biggest names within the community, within the culture, to be a part of it. So that's another phrase from my team when we push someone to do something they don't want to do. We follow it up with a, it's a lifestyle, hun. So just my last point, how do you create an environment for failure? I think that's a really important one for us as leaders to publicly fail. You know, again, LinkedIn is awash with everybody's success stories at the moment of very strange stories actually, of every tiny thing that they do, but talking more publicly about what did work and what didn't work. And then I think from a hospitality perspective specifically, going out and finding brands that no one's expecting you to be aligned with, I think it's going to be really important. And the role that hospitality plays within fashion and music, we're going to be seeing it more and more of. And it just... It's just more fun. You just get so much more content of it. The press are more interested in that. I sat with an editor of a London newspaper about four weeks ago. And three years ago, he said to me at lunch, I don't want any more fucking press releases, Charlotte. Just send me a WhatsApp with your top five bullet points and an image, and I'll tell you if I'm going to run it or not. And we've been saying to clients when they've been asking for press releases, our PR team recently, no, we're not doing it. Just give us your five key messages of what you want to land and let us go and talk to our network about it. And those are kind of the things that I think we're going to shift and see more and more shifts, sorry, over the next few months. Because again, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Thank you. Amazing.